various people, and for one reason or another, none of it succeeded. Then we were given the idea by Mark Wilson and by Zeno Wendler, both of whom made the case for the Churchlands. They came down, and it was clear they were big, uh, courageous, somewhat far out thinkers. Messi Paul was messianic. I remember talking to him. At eight, I'm saying, this guy is incredible. I mean, he's a true believer. We all agreed to hire him. Once they got here, however, and they began to bring students in and make their argument, and we had a lot of great arguments, you and I had a lot of great arguments, some people, you know, felt uncomfortable, and a few, very few, felt positively alienated. So it was a divider. It was a divider, but clearly the development of the department and all the people that I mentioned that came after would not have come and been here had it not been for that hire. So it turned out to be a bet that paid off extremely uh, well and had a huge influence, not the least of which was Pat Churchland's <coughs> unprecedented six years as chair. Six, not the normal three. Six, in which she proved herself to be a consummate pragmatist and extremely politically shrewd and managed to convince us that we could hire people, several people, a number of people, not by having them all on campus for a personal interview, but by sending five or six of our people to the meetings and having them do the interview there. So with Henry, I want to say that we're indebted to the church, but also to Pat for really creating the fourth reincarnation of the program. And, you know, people like Don and, and Eric Watkins um, and Dana and Sam, who are now, in many ways, the heart of the department. So those are my recollections. Thank you. Now, we've got some time for your comments or questions for our panelists. Please come up and speak into the microphone, Professor White. Make sure it's on the top. Two very brief uh, uh, anecdotes. I, I was here as a graduate student. I received both my master's and right, PhD uh, from the program when I was here in the uh, first half of the 70s. Uh, and uh, as I think George mentioned, San Diego at that time was a very conservative place. Um, so the early 70s in San Diego were really the late 60s. <laughs> it, it, it took San Diego in the 70s what every place else in the country was really the late 60s. So that means that part of my, my recollections are not really fit to tell in public. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are a couple that are. Um, uh, Ava mentioned uh, the fact that the department was a very polyglot place at that time. Uh, polymath uh, would be an appropriate term as well. People were really learning. First thing that I think impressed graduate students uh, uh, at that time. So one of my brief anecdotes has to do with the polyglot nature and the other the polymath. Uh, the polyglot nature uh, indirectly uh, 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 pertains to Abram. It, he modestly uh, disclaimed being a polyglot, but of course we know that's not true. Uh, he knows Italian very well, uh, and I think due to the uh, armed services. Uh, he at one point acquired some considerable knowledge of uh, Japanese uh, as well. Uh, but my uh, uh, polyglot uh, story has to do with a person that I think that he had met in Italy, as I recollect, who came here to visit uh, uh, during my tenure as a graduate student uh, and uh, uh, teach. She was supposed to teach a seminar. And I don't even remember the, the yes, I think maybe it was. Anyway, her English was not good. Uh, uh, and so I think we sort of lim reached the limit of the polyglot uh, uh, tradition in the department here, at least as far as the graduate students were concerned. So she was incapable of teaching the seminar in uh, English. And the students were incapable of uh, attending the seminar in Italian. So French was the compromise. Uh, and I don't think anyone understood anyone. Uh, the uh, second uh, story has to do with uh, polymath and uh, Herbert Marcuse.
Marcos. Uh, there are many, as I'm sure all of you will know, uh, uh, Marcos stories. I have several of my own. But my favorite was right after I arrived here, in the, uh, would have been the fall of 1970, uh, my first uh, uh, introductions to the department. Uh, Herbert uh, smoked a large cigar. At that time, he liked to hang around the, uh, the, uh, the uh, office, kibitzing with the uh, staff people. Uh, was always around there, often reading his uh, his uh, 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 mail, uh, uh, which he got a lot. A lot of it was uh, hostile, some of it obscene. He would ask people to explain obscene <laughs> English uh, and I didn't quite understand, so on and so forth. So this was a, a regular occurrence. And there was another graduate student at that time who was more senior uh, than I, uh, Gerald Press, who was the uh, editor of the Journal of History and Philosophy for a, a number of years. And he was a student of uh, Jason Saunders, who had left by that time. But uh, Jerry Kratz, his student, was still there. In fact, he defended his dissertation uh, about the same I time I did. So he was here for a, while, a lot longer than I was. But we were talking uh, one day. I just met him. And I was very interested in Greek philosophy. And uh, so we were chatting in the office. And Herbert was standing there with a cigar doing his usual thing. We weren't paying attention to him, and we assumed he wasn't paying any attention uh, to us. And uh, so we were talking about uh, uh, Jerry's uh, uh, dissertation, which was on the Greek concept of history. And uh, I thought I, I thought this was very interesting. I thought, well, I could maybe have something to add to this, since it was something I just happened to have been thinking about and written an you know, undergraduate paper on. So I was involved in this rather esoteric discussion Greek conception of, uh, of history. And I said something, God knows what, it probably wasn't very well informed. Uh, and uh, Jerry replied, uh, probably much better informed uh, than, uh, than I was. And he said, well, there's something to that. It's not quite right. And all of a sudden, uh, Herbert appears. He comes over and, and walks over. And he quite literally puts his finger on my chest and says, and Germanic accent, which I will attempt to uh, uh, replicate. Uh, young man, what you said was false. <laughs> and he turned on Neil uh, to walk away. And then he thinks a moment, there's this pause where you can see him pause, uh, see him pause. And then he goes back and he does the same thing to Jerry Press with the finger on the chest. And he said, and what you said is false as well, and in your case, there's less excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else like to make a comment? Please. It's a comment and a question, and a little bit of history. Uh, part of this has to do with philosophy uh, then and now. Um, my name is Kevin Walsh. I'm a graduate student in history of science. And as part of doing uh, my dissertation research, I came across a quote from Abel Stroll in 1985, and it was on the topic of academic freedom. Uh, there was a historical incident with lasting consequences that had to do with uh, the prescribed nation's controversy. Uh, UCSD is home to one of the first academic supercomputer centers, and the Reagan administration uh, the national security regime wanted to restrict foreign scholars and graduate students from using that center. It created quite a controversy. You were quoted in the LA Times. Uh, Margie Casario, the UC Academic Center uh, president at the time, sent a letter to every line faculty person uh, saying, we as an academic community have to decide whether the price of having a supercomputer center on campus, this was a $200 million award in 1984, $85, largest award that the NSF. So that was a question. Abram again was quoted. So what, how this uh, truce came about in the form of the National Security Directive 189. That is the policy that guides the relationship between the academic research community and the national security establishment to this day. It has been signed out by every president 
since that time, including Obama. So back to now, it appears to me that the UCSD philosophy department was a moral voice with regard to Marcuse and Reagan and Clark Kerr being kicked out as the UC president in that time. So back to now, um, I'm wondering where is the voice, especially concerning the essential value of academic freedom in the present, mm -hmm. and where where is the voice of, of the academy at this campus and in the larger university? One of the reasons I started doing this research into the department is because I had heard accusations that the department and the faculty and the overall university had abandoned Marcuse and that the department had abandoned its interest in its own history and was trying to forget it all and had nothing to do with this and, and so forth anymore. And what I found is that's completely false, that as, as you say, with respect to this case, and there are several others, uh, the department has, you know, in, in many cases, gone out on a limb in defense of academic freedom, including the hiring of Stanley Moore, the defense of Marcuse, what you mentioned. I think there are many other examples. And so that's, there obviously needs to be a longer answer to the question, but uh, I, I'm not aware that one could accuse uh, the department's uh, defense of this, stalwart defense of this, is kind of flagging. Um, if anything, um, you know, we, we're, we're trying to um, dutifully maintain it according to the very high standards that the department was founded on and set up on. And so I'd just like to close with, with uh, yes, please, George S. I, uh I wanted to say in response to the question that um, the examples I spoke of earlier of uh, Stanley Moore and Herbert Marcuse uh, show really the commitment of the campus uh, to academic freedom. Uh, last year and the year before, we had an incident on the campus that concerned actually the division that had to do academic, uh, with academic freedom. And there was a massive investigation actually in the whole system uh, about the case, and uh, the defense of academic freedom was far weaker uh, two years ago than it was uh, that time at the height of the Vietnam War, a few years uh, after the McCarthy era, uh, and that is really a surprising, a surprising fact. But since we're all interested here about the history of the department, I wanted to make a couple of corrections and tell you an anecdote about uh, Herbert. Uh, Pat Sessions did not hire uh, uh, Don, and Mark Wilson was not instrumental in bringing here uh, the Sessions or the Kitchers. For the history, this should be corrected. Uh, the anecdote is this, since Mark Wilson's uh, game came, name came up. Herbert Marcuse, just before he died, it must have been in about 1976 or something like this. Because I was chair. Yeah. I was chair then. So it had to be after 78. Well, after, it could have been after 78. I just don't remember the date. Gave the last lecture at UCSD in the auditorium at what is now uh, Galbraith Hall. It was then the uh, Humanities Library. And it was a huge auditorium, and it was packed completely. And he gave the last lecture on aesthetics. And I was sitting with uh, Mark Wilson, as you heard, he was a philosopher of science. And Herbert gave this very eloquent lecture. Really, it was one of the best things I ever heard, although I didn't understand very much, um, because it came from a tradition that I did not know very well, but it was really uh, uh, very well uh, written. And uh, most of the lecture centered around death. 
uh, premonition on his part that it was coming.